We begin with Jim Brooks. The characters created by him are some of the most enduring in television and film over the last 20 years. Mary Richards from the Mary Tyler Moore Show, Jack Nicholson's raunchy astronaut in terms of endearment, and Holly Hunter's peripatetic television producer in broadcast news. And now with I'll Do Anything, which stars Nick Nolte and Albert Brooks and opens later this week, Jim Brooks introdu introduces us to a few more in a tale of Hollywood itself, and we're very pleased to have him here. Welcome. How you doing? I'm all right. It's been a while since we've seen each other. Uh -huh. I, think, I think it was probably in the, what, what are they, the commissary at 20th Century Fox. Yeah, that's right. Waved across the yeah. room. Uh, tell me, there's, there's more print, more stories about the making of this film okay. as there are about the film itself. Right. How do you feel about that? Uh, terrible, you know, just terrible. I, I, I started at this movie out as a musical, filmed right. it as a musical, and then early on, at the earliest point in the process, realized that the music took away from the reality of the characters. The thing I want most from this movie is that it be real and it be funny. Yeah. So when that reality was threatened, I began, you know, a process that ended up in making it a non-musical. Never happened before, certainly worth talking about some. I have it coming, yeah. having made a mistake in the beginning. Right. All that stuff, fine. Uh, the problem was that, that I had to go public and talk about my movie while I was working on it. And that's something that shouldn't happen to anybody, because the whole thing you're trying to do is lose all idea of self and, you know, whether it's going to be successful or not. And, and there's a kind of attention that we got before the studio saw the picture. Mm -hmm. So that my only choice was either, was either to try and stonewall it, which is, you know, which is never smart, or to just talk about it at that, to say, come on in and talk about it. But talking about it had its price because it distracted me. And then finally I got my privacy back and I was able to complete my okay. work. It distracted you in a sense. What you would prefer is to say, making a movie is a process and it's never over until we offer up the film. The director offers up the film for the audience to see. Correct? Yeah, it doesn't seem like a preference. It seems yeah. like common sense. I mean, right. you know, In this you, way that a you, painter you know, picture, a composer draft produces a Paint, uh, pr produces a piece of music and a painter. Yeah, yeah. But it's, we're we're in different times now, and I don't want to, you know, it's 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 it, my thing is not to dwell on it because it was terrible while it was happening, but it's worked mm. out. Allow me a little bit though. All right, okay. all right. Uh, why was it forced on you? What happened to force it on you? Um, we had we had a preview before the studio saw it, and that preview with the music in it clearly had problems. Right. And, and the problems were you believed, or the audience believed first, that the different music... Mo two different movies. It was two different movies for them. Right. It was that simple, you know. Right. And part I, musical and part story and comedy. And, well, I think it was a little more complicated than that. I think they engaged the characters so completely, and they were enjoying that movie with the characters so that when the music happened, it broke that experience for them. Fine. Okay, now I'm supposed to go back to work. You do it on every picture. A little more dramatic this time, but that's what you mm. do. You spend six months on post-production. It's, it's, it's a creative time. Uh, I, I, it was too early to even show it to the studio. I was faced with a situation where they were going to write about a preview and that it went badly and that would have been very injurious. So rather than do that, I said, uh, come to the previews, come to my next two previews, because I knew the work would go on and the picture would get better and, it, you know, that happens. Uh, but there, the price was, you know, the whole deal is you've got to lose self-consciousness. That's the work. You lose self-consciousness and you serve the movie. And during that time when I was made to feel self-conscious because of this, and I think, didn't you go through a period of your life where suddenly there, there it was, you, you know, people were scrutinizing you during a ridiculous two-week yeah. period or something? Yes. Yes. I think I was around then when that was happening. And, and, yeah. and, and for somebody else, it was, you know, it, it was silly. It shouldn't have happened. But that, so you know what it's like. Uh, it was like that for me, and I'd never been through it before. But, but now, I, you know, I want to, I want to, I'm through it, thank heavens. You know, yeah. the, the, the picture's being well-received and, uh, and, you know, it is the, pic it is the picture that should have happened. All right. This, the picture you have made that I have seen is the picture you wanted to make. Yeah, of course. Uh, yeah. Just stay with the musical notion a second, though. Uh, <laughs> sure. <laughs> no, no, but come on, because we've got a lot of time here. Okay. Uh, it is that, why did you want to make a musical? Well, <laughs> I thought that because it dealt with Hollywood and a six-year-old child, among other things, right. that, the, that the music could help me get to a deeper reality. And instead, just the opposite happened. Because the, the, the musical work, I think, was good. Yeah. But it just, it, it couldn't be real and immediate. And the characters do not have easy answers, and they're complicated. You, you know, for a comedy, they're sort of complicated characters. And, um, and it got in the way. It just yeah. got in the way of that experience. And the prime thing, you, you know, you start with making, the, the idea is to make it real and true. Yeah. And people are saying that when you look at musicals in Hollywood, most of them don't work. There hasn't been one that works since, say, Greece in about 1978. And they also said if anybody can make it work, it was you. 
do you still hunger to make? Does there still something inside of you that wants to make a musical? No, there was never something like that inside okay. of me. I really thought I could serve this situation Story. best in that form. That's that, what attracted me to it. You know, okay. th I, I was never that guy who, you know, always dreamed of doing a musical. What's the story you wanted to tell? Well, it, I don't know quite a, you know, okay, I, well, I, I try not to do pictures that, yeah. you, that you know, I, I, I don't know how to tell this in one sentence. I knew I wanted to do, I'll tell you some of the goals and the right, ambitions okay, of the picture. Fine. I wanted to show that a six-year-old child could be a complicated character. Yeah, not just boy, you that, show that. That yeah, a child is yeah. a complicated character. I wanted to take a look at Hollywood that avoided, that, that showed what's new, you know, without, without you know, it, and it gets complicated here. I didn't have, I don't have any Trust conversation, Jim. <laughs> we can take it. Come on. <laughs> you know, Bill Hurt used to have this great thing right. that he said, that the idea isn't to give answers, the idea is to, is to play the question. And right. to really, and, and, and I hope this picture, you know, makes the question happen. We have a main character in there who sort of represents Hollywood to me, which is the Jolie Richardson character. Right. And this is a young producer who she's a, she's she's a D girl. She's a development right, girl. She's right. a she's she she works for a producer. She works for a producer, right. and she's on her way up. And she know. wants to be a Hollywood m mover and shaker. She Most wants to make she wants to make movies. Now, mm -hmm. making movies, what does that mean? It means right. whoever you're talking to, you know, she wants to help decide what movies to make. She's she's ambitious, you know, correctly so, and she sort of represents Hollywood. And what I, one of the things I like is that if you go with someone to see the movie in the parking lot afterwards, the chances are you'll have an argument about this girl, mm -hmm. whether she's good or bad. And she does represent Hollywood to me, and I'm glad you can have the argument in the parking lot mm -hmm. because, uh, you know, this is, this is a, 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 a lot of this movie is me confronting myself as well as, you know, just to, this is, I never intended this to be a movie from any place on high or low me, with me looking at Hollywood. I, I meant it, me to face myself about because I've been there for 20 years now. Facing yourself in what way? Uh, about what? It's, it's a place where cynicism happens very easily, but, but I think that's happening almost, I, don't, I no longer think Hollywood is the capital of cynicism. You know, I think, I think, you know, some of the stuff we were talking about earlier, the fact, the fact that I, that we, that if we start talking right now at length, you know, we'll talk about the Menendez boys, we'll talk about, we'll talk about figure skating, we'll talk about, you know, and, and the fact that our minds are filled with this stuff promotes cynicism. And I used to think there was a, there was a, there was a, there was a line that we all crossed at a certain point where we were filled with, with, with fallen idols, where the only thing that bound us together as, as a country or anything else was that everybody had somebody that they believed in where suddenly there was a story that made that person seem like trash. And I think there's a big effect from that. You know, this has been going on for about 10 years when we took that swing. And once we took that swing, there was no looking back so that you begin to question heroes. And, and, and in this picture, when I try to define, because you always try and do that, what makes, your, what makes your lead character a hero? And this guy's a hero because he's a good guy. He's simply decency, a good guy. Decency, some have said. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, this what this is about are characters that have some decency and they can't, and juxtapositioned against someone who's running on raw ambition. And not, and not so raw. I mean, you know, what's interesting about Kathy, I think, in the picture is that she's open, she's funny, she's pretty. Yeah. You know, you'd like to spend some time with her. She has these character flaws, don't we all? Yeah. How serious are they? What will they add up to? I think it's, you know, I think it's like that. And usually it takes me like two or three years to realize what a picture was about, you know, because I think if you serve the picture, you have all these other talented people you're working with, they serve it, and then when you get objective, you look at it and you say, oh, that's what it was, you know? Yeah. In this case, it, it occurred to me, it occurred to me with like the first public screening that it's about uh, the struggle for decency. Yeah. Interesting to me is that it's, it, you have said this before, you were making a movie about something you know a lot about, Hollywood, and something you knew nothing about, which is to be raised by, what it means to be raised by a father, because you didn't have that opportunity. Yeah, yeah, my father left home periodically and then finally when I was pr pretty young. Yeah, and so that, it makes it personal for you, this, and, yeah, and, and your feature film become very personal. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Uh, there is, is there much, I guess I'm, I'm struggling with, well, I like the film a lot, you know, and what was interesting to me were those two things. I mean, I'm not a father, so I was fascinated by the relationship of the father to the daughter. You know, and his coming to grips because he hadn't really been a father because the daughter had been away, and then he took, you know, she came back to him, 
and how he came to love that relationship. It's so, it's so interesting because because here was a guy who said it's going to you know he's a he's a gifted character actor who's yeah. lacking something right. that, get, that gets in the way of him really making it. And what is that? I mean, uh, well, in the picture, it's some it's some it's sort of funny. It's in, the, in the picture, it's sort of some sexuality, some question about how sexy he is on screen. Yeah, but that, you point out the irony in, in a wonderful way because this producer we've just been talking about tries to seduce him, and yet when she has to vote on a screening that he's done, she, after listening to other people's opinion, says hey, he's not somebody I want to go to bed with, right? And is there some irony and some contradiction that you would point well, out I think to that's, us? Well, I think that's the argument in the parking lot. Is yeah. that professionalism or betrayal, you know? Uh, I thought it was betrayal. Jolie, jo Jolie Richardson, who played the, the girl, thought it was professionalism. And the thing I'm most pleased about is each of each of those attitudes is in the character. You know, I just think each of it is there. People people disagree on this, and they should. All right. Let me take a look at a clip because I, I found, I mean, the notion of what you do here as what you did to broadcasting to the broadcast journalism is fascinating to me. We had long debates about that at the, after that film <laughs> came out, broadcast news in newsrooms and at all the networks and in local stations around the country. Here's a first clip from I'll Do Anything. Take a look. <laughs> was he in McKellen? Was that yes, in the West? Yes, yes, yes. yes. And, and Harry Shear is in here. And did yes. I see, um, a fascinating number of people that I saw in there. The, um, something I wanted to ask you, and I forgot about it for a second. The, there was a great moment in which one of the, Julie Krabner was talking about the relation, the difference, she'd come from Washington, and she was comparing <laughs> yeah. Washington to Los Angeles. Basically saying they're all the same, in a sense, the same sense of what? Remember those I, I lines? I, you wrote the lines. Well, it's, a, it's a long speech. Yeah. I don't remember all of it, but I mean, it, it, had, it, it had to do with the same spiritual bloodletting was, was yeah. one of the lines. Uh, Overprivileged people gone mad trying to hold on to their privileges. Yeah. Um, and she ended up saying, I do miss the seasons, though. <laughs> Everything else, there was <laughs> yeah, no difference whatsoever. Right. No difference. Is that your view of Washington? I mean, the, the comparison between Hollywood and Washington? It took me, you know, I spent, I spent a long time in Washington getting ready for broadcast news, and yeah. I never understood when people talked about the similarity, and then finally I did. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's always fascinating. The notion is that in Washington, they worship movie stars, and in Hollywood, they worship <laughs> politicians. I mean, that's the only difference in the two. I guess that's true. Um, the casting, you once said to me that you would not have made broadcast news unless you could have gotten Bill Hurt. That's right. Right? Do you feel like that about any of these characters in this film, in the casting of this film, that any particular person was essential to you making this movie? Well, after the fact, I, feel that, I do feel that way about all of them. Uh, yeah. the, the person that I was told in this movie, that, that, that where it was, first of all, I, Nick had a very difficult job because he had to star in a movie and convince everybody he couldn't possibly be a movie star. That yeah. was a job. So he had a very, and he had all these subtle things to play and, and, and this regular guy stuff. And you had, to, you had to believe he lacked something yeah. as, as he was in a movie that intrigued you and had you love the character. It's yeah. very difficult. You so couldn't be thinking about Nick Nolte, the movie star, as you watch this. You had to be thinking about the character. Well, Nick's baggage is great for this movie because in some, in some way, you know, the good thing about the subject is that we all know a lot about it. We all know a lot about Hollywood in the movies. There's a, there's a scene in here which is causing more conversation than I imagined it would, where we mention real names. We have a casting session, and, yeah. and we go down the real names of some of the best actors we have who are casually trashed mm -hmm. in the session. Yeah. This yeah. Is, and let me just pick up on that, because and that is the scene in which Nick Nolte playing this actor of decency, who's a great character actor. Everybody says he has talent. And he is infuriated that some young uh, nitwit is acting, is casting aspersions on this whole list of actors who yes. you just mentioned, yeah. saying Ed Harris because of his hair, yeah. and so on, so on, yeah, so on, yeah. so on, so on. Yeah. Go ahead, make your point. And, and, and Nick rises up in, in a fury, and, and he addresses it, and I think he's addressing all of us at that point, because we, I think a lot of us in our lives have begun to casually trash people in ways that we don't even catch ourselves doing half the time. There's, there's, there's this kind of move that's made in, in common decency and manners. Yeah. And, and you know, the part that he's trying for like crazy in the picture, the film within the film, yeah. is he wants to, they're doing a remake of Mr. Deeds Goes to Town. Right. And, and, he, and he, that is his Deeds moment. And he would have been perfect casting for Deeds because he rises up like Deeds in, in that way. Uh, so, so Nick had a very difficult job doing that because everyone's, the thing that made it wonderful is that we know he's been denied that A-list in his life. We know that only recently did he become a yeah, movie right. star, you know, but we, always, but we respect him as an actor. We've seen him do a variety of parts, we, you know, for a long period of time now. So his baggage gave it the power and righteousness I think it needed and made it theater. Because I think when that scene happens with an audience, it becomes theater because we, 
it's that odd moment. We know everybody they're talking about. We know these people. We've looked at them on the screen. We have attitudes, you know. There's even a moment when, you know, you never spoke, you, the one thing you never do in a movie is have somebody look directly in the camera. Yeah. There's, there's four seconds where Albert Brooks looks directly in the camera when he talks about what he thinks the obligation to an audience is. And at that moment, too, I think, I think the screen disappears and, the, and, and, and you are talking to the audience and it's gone before you know it. But I think it's great because, because we're part of that story. As an audience, we're part of the story of this film. There is also, I mean, there's so many things, but there's also this. Um, well, let me just talk about the casting again. Whitney Wright, the wo young woman who well, plays Jeannie, is, is named Whitney. Whitney Wright, Wright. And, and that's, and everybody, girl, warned, woman, everybody warned me it was an uncastable part. That was purely uncastable. To find a kid who could play somebody this complicated. She's supposed to be six. Mm. So all the common intelligence was, you know, get a nine-year-old who's short, who can play younger, who has some sophistication, some experience. And Whitney was four when we hired her. <laughs> So it, it's, it's sort of, she, it, it is a miracle. I look at the picture now and I, and I don't know quite how that performance happened because there's no way to talk about it except as a performance. She's nothing like the child she plays. She's never known a child like the child that, that she plays in this movie. And yet she did it. And our big deal was, I kept on, on saying to Nick, our danger is that, because it's like a romantic comedy and the romantic comedy is between this father and this daughter. I mean, that's, yeah, that's yeah, what, yeah, that's what yeah. it feels like to me. And it always felt like that to me. And, I, and, and with Nick, I said, the danger is we have this five-year-old kid, we have this grown man, and we'll each give all the attention to Whitney because she's this little button. But we can't shortchange you because you have a really difficult role here. So we had to make demands on Whitney as an actress. As bizarre and absurd as it sounds, she, she met those challenges. Nick would sometimes say, I need you to be there for me now, when it wasn't her scene. We do things where they say, which were hysterical, where they change dialogue with each other. And Nick would do her part, and she'd see how he approached it in his freedom, and she'd, <laughs> and she'd do Nick. What's the most sensitive for you in terms of your own life experiences, most sensitive part of the film? Because you've said a lot of interesting things about the thing you fear most is abandonment and things like that. Um, Where are you the, way out the there? The difficulty, the difficulty in, in, the difficulty in people making connections, I think, is in the picture. How difficult that is for almost all of them, for almost all of them to, you know, like sometimes I have, when I was writing the script, what I had in mind was something very simple. And, and perhaps I could have kept it a musical if I'd kept it that simple, who knows. Uh, and that was Albert Brooks would be this cretin who would get his just desserts at the end, who, bit, you know, hiss the villain and stuff like that. And, and the Jolie Richardson character would, would be this, the wonderful girl who completed the family unit at the end, and off we go. But as I wrote it, I began to have some sympathy for the Albert Brooks character, and I had started to have some suspicions for the Jolie Richardson character, and I decided to trust those two instincts. And it did get much closer to the truth once I did that, because in truth, you know, Albert plays a producer with a piece missing. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a way to look at that where it's a tragedy. You know. And that's what Julie Kravner sees. Yeah, that's exactly Man right. Mulhani, that's yeah. what she sees. Yes, and that's, and that's the nature of their love for each other. That's what finally happens, I think. Uh, you know, he, there's, a, there's a joke in the picture which I think explains everything about their relationship where he, he says, give me another chance, and she says, you're just saying that because, uh, because you're on the verge of failure and you're without a core. And he says, see, nobody else gets me. And I think that's the truth. That's the nature of their love. Yeah. The, there's also a wonderful moment in which uh, Julie Crabden is a marvelous woman who has the most decency of anybody in the film, perhaps, along with Nick Dolte, but, but who really does is a, an incredible performance by her, in which she goes up at, after listening to Kathy, the, the, of Jolie Richardson part, play, she plays somebody named mm -hmm. Kathy Breslow. And she's talking about the relationship. And she turns and says, well, she says something. Then her, her line is, her, her great line, she says, you know, you're not good enough for him. <laughs> or he's too good for you. Well, Julie, Julie as a character is taking so many pills, including vitamins, homeopathic films, that they've all formed a potion in her where she's compelled to tell the truth. Yeah. And that was so interesting to deal with what the truth is, because it's blameless. And so she is your truth teller through this film. Truth teller through the film. Yeah. Er Go ahead. And it's fun because every word she says is the truth. Right. Let me take a look at another clip because t set this up for me in terms of what you're saying as the writer, as the producer, and the director. This is when... Probably, no please laugh. Let's right. say, let's <laughs> yeah, let's see. probably. Without always, what clip always it is. that. <laughs> this is the cl when they're making love. And, oh. and this is Nick Nolte. And I mean, it seems to be obvious, but set oh. it up in maybe more subtlety out of your mind. Well, uh, let, let me just say there are special challenges to intimacy <laughs> in Hollywood. Roll tape. Here it is. 
Uh, so, so, I mean, you know what's going to happen here is you can reinforce every instinct that middle America has about Hollywood. Well, wait a minute. One of those guys is a decent guy trying to do a job who just <laughs> got seduced in a way that few people could resist. <laughs> and, and yet, and in, in what he's part of it too. Yeah, and what drives him away in the end? I mean, he's saying how crazy it is for you to let something interrupt sex as she's listening to these messages, and the thing that interrupts him is concern for his daughter. Well, yes. Yeah, I mean, it, yes, yes, absolutely. Uh, but also the fact that she, you know, that she leaves the phone on, and I think there's been there's been moments there's never been a moment like that in my life. But there sure have been weekends in my life where I didn't dare go out to get food because the phone might ring with, with that important message that, that, you know, that I was waiting to hear, somebody's reaction to a script or something, where you're chained to your house. How long ago have you had, before, since you've had those kinds of moments? Um, I mean, 10 years. 10 years ago. Yeah. yeah. But this was after, you'd made, you were, after you had already made the Mary Tyler Moore show and a lot of other things and well, given you a terrific track record. Well, the strange thing was that, that, that you know, I, I did my first movie in 83, right. and, and in 83, the wall between television and movies was, was uh, fortified. I mean, you just didn't make it across. If you were a television person, you stayed here and you did television. You're a movie person, you're a movie person. And, and a few actors crossed over, but almost no one else. And then all of a sudden, you know, 83, 84, 85, 86, and it changed so completely that, you know, n now all these movies they're making movies of all these television shows. And, and now you can go back and forth. I mean, you yes, work on The Simpsons. Yeah. And, and tell me about uh, shifting gears away from this film for a second about The Critic. Yeah, The Critic just started just a, just it's, a week it's ago. It's on ABC we had a first and it got episode. rave reviews. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, it's an animation done with two other people that worked on The Simpsons, and, and it's about yeah, the Reason. life of a critic. Yeah, Mike Reese and Al Jean. And they had also worked on The Simpsons. And it's, and it's something that started out as a live action show. And over two years of talking about it and certain dynamics and pressures that came in, we said, let's make it animated. And, I mean, and then first it wasn't going to be about a critic, then it was, and John Lovitz was going to have it, and then, and then it was going to be a regular live action mm -hmm. show. But the animation, I think, you know, is, is the best thing that happened to us because it allow us, allows us to do takeoffs on, on any movie you can think of. You know, money is no object in that sense when you're drawing it. Yeah. Do you like the capacity now to go back and forth from both mediums, both yeah, it, film and television? The amount of work got overwhelming and crazy, but I think I've passed through that. You know, at that time, that was that wasn't smart, but um, but the critic has in it, you know, the chance to just be. You know, when when we had the premiere party the other night, I was I was saying to Mike and Al, the one thing that happens to you as you watch a show is you say, I want to write for that show. Yeah. You know, because it it does offer that. It can be pure fun. What do you like about animation? How does that? Uh, the freedom. The freedom. You know, the fr the freedom of it. You're not limited in any production way to your story. And then, and, then, and then the trick is to make people forget it's animated and make those people real enough. Yeah. You know, the same thing we're saying about the movie, actually. Right. Take a look at this. This is a scene from The Critic. Great to have you here, Jim. It really is. It's, I, I really did like the film, and it says a lot, uh, as it did in broadcast news. There are certain truths that come out, and there's certainly uh, you get a sense both of the relationship uh, among people and the sense of the, the vulnerability of that sort of connection uh, that people are all striving for, as well as a, a sense of, of comedy about uh, a place that I suspect you both love and see the flaws of. Great. I'm glad you liked it. Uh, Thank you very much. We'll be right back. It's Doc Perlman is here. Stay with us.